Hi, we're back with the GPS Disciplined Oscillator project with the PCB that we had made at PCB Way. And it's been a little while since my last video, and that's because this thing has been sucking up all of my spare time. And I wanted to post the next video at least when I'd got somewhere fairly reasonable. Now, conceptually, this whole project is very simple. We've got a one pulse per second coming in, you can see it blinking away. And all we need to do is count all of the pulses and work out exactly what frequency we're running at and adjust the DAC value to control the ovenized oscillator. So what we've got on the screen is two sine waves. The one in red is from a commercial GPS disciplined oscillator and the one in blue is the one from my PCB. And where we want to get to is where either both of these are steady on the screen so they both look like they're exactly running at the same frequency. When it's whizzing across like that, that means it's triggered on one, but the other one isn't at the same frequency. Where it'd be nicer to get to is where both of these are perfectly in phase, and what you'd actually see is both of them overlaid across each other. Now, the difficulty is that we don't have that nice 10 megahertz reference to reference against. What we've actually got is a one pulse per second that's coming in, and that's quite a big time difference between the 10 megahertz and the one pulse per second. Now there's many ways to implement a GPS disciplined oscillator. We only have that one pulse per second coming in, so we've got a couple of problems with that. Firstly, our control loop can only make adjustments really at once per second at the most, because we don't have the extra data to be able to run it a lot faster. The other problem is that there is some jitter on that one, one pulse per second. So if you were to make updates every second, um, you know, you're likely to end up with some error. Now, a slow response is something that's desirable once we've tuned in because we don't actually want to be twiddling the frequency up and down all the time, but we do want to get there relatively quickly. Now, the method that I'm currently experimenting with is more like implementing a frequency counter. So we've got our one pulse per second coming in and effectively we're counting the pulses from the ovenized oscillator coming out. Now, that's conceptually very simple, and you could even do that just on a pick, and I, that's one of the first things that I tried just to see how close we could get to. The problem is that you don't have a lot of resolution, so you might read 10 million counts for 4 seconds, and then the fifth one would be the one where you're accounting for the error with not being able to count and resolve frequencies higher than that. So really, you want to be sampling that uh, 10 megahertz output at a much higher frequency so that you can make adjustments more timely and more accurately. The other way that you can do the GPS disciplined oscillator is with a phased lock loop. Now Lars on the EV blog forum, who unfortunately is no longer with us, came up with this really nice schematic. This is actually elegantly simple and something that's really quite nice. Basically, it's using a PLL chip along with some digital counting as well. So we're incorporating the best of both worlds. We've got 10 megahertz input from the oven oscillator, and then we're dividing that down to five megahertz and one megahertz. Now, I think the reason that he dropped this to five megahertz is so that it can be counted easily on the Pro Mini. But the key here is that we've got this division down to one megahertz, and then we're comparing the phase against the one pulse per second coming in. That means that we only get one signal out every second and the maximum pulse width is 0 to 1 microsecond. But through this little analog filter and a combination of knowing the frequency coming in and having more resolution on the ADC, he's able to resolve down to 1 nanosecond. And I wanted to try and get there digitally and using the FPGA. And that's where I've spent a lot of my time recently just faffing around and learning quite a lot. It's been a while since I played with a FPGA for high frequency counting, and that's where a lot of the fun has been had. Now we're definitely not there yet, but we're getting close to the point where we're getting to a working example. I've got a little block of foam here that sits on the ovenized oscillator, and um, there's a little cutout in it, and that stops any drafts or anything like that from affecting the ovenized oscillator because despite it being in a case and ovenized even if you get a little cold breeze or put a drink near it that seems to set it off quite a lot. So we'll just have a look at where we've got to and at the moment um, it's just reading the output from the serial port and what we do first of all is allow it some time for the ovenized oscillator to heat up and then we're doing a little bit of calibration at first just to try and get us as close as possible 
to the 10 megahertz that we're not spending ages in a control loop trying to get there. So first of all, we're warming up, then we set the DAC to a low setting. At the moment, I've just set it to 64, and we work out what the error in frequency, well, actually in time is, so 735 nanoseconds out. And then we do it again, but with the high setting. And then you can see here, it's just estimated what that should be. And we're getting pretty close to that 10 megahertz already. So then it just checks that and sees what the error is after a certain period of time. There does need to be some settling periods. First of all, there needs to be a one second block because the DAC has to adjust and the ovenized oscillator has to adjust. And then we do a bit of averaging over a longer period of time. I noticed that the sort of sawtooth waveform from the one pulse per second has a period of several seconds. So once you're out of that period, it doesn't seem to have a significant effect. Once it's worked out what the error is, then it starts going into the continuous control loop where we're actually just twiddling the least significant bit of the DAC. And here you can see within about 45 seconds, we're almost there. You can see the sine waves are pretty much lined up. If I have a look at the frequency counter, it's reading 10 million and we're about two parts per billion out already. So it's actually almost there. What's quite interesting is how accurate reading it on the screen like this with the two sine waves is. The frequency counter takes quite a bit of time to get there, but visually on the screen you can see how it's drifting just very slightly in and out of phase, but we're pretty much there. So it's working really quite well. There's a lot of work to be done, but that's my sort of early working prototype. And we'll now just have a little look at some of the software. And maybe if you have a look at this and you've got any suggestions or a better way of doing things, then certainly those are appreciated in the comments. And I'm probably thinking that once we get to the point where when building the proper board, I do think it's going to be worthwhile having some analog input as well, using a PLL type thing to work out the time interval between the two sine waves. Because although the it would be nice to keep it all digital, I think there is some nice things to have by having that analog input as well. The only problem with that is that we do rely on some of the properties of the R's and the C's. That means you do need a very high quality capacitor. You want a resistor with a very good temperature coefficient and that kind of thing if you're going to rely on those numbers. Now over the past few weeks I've been experimenting with a few different things on the Mac X02 um, FPGA. One of those is a PLL, which operates very similarly to the 4046 PLL that we saw in that schematic. However, the problem is, is that this doesn't run asynchronously. You do have to have a clocked process, and therefore we are limiting our resolution. So this is running at 125 megahertz, and basically at that point you've already limited your resolution to 10 times more than the actual 10 megahertz output, but that only gives you a certain number of steps to be able to lock it in. So you could get very close, but you would be jiggling the DAC up and down to approximate 10 megahertz exactly, rather than just sitting there exactly at 10 megahertz. So this sort of worked, but I wasn't particularly happy with the performance. And now you might ask, why don't I just increase the frequency? And the problem is that you have to take into account the propagation delays and the setup and hold times and everything with all of the logic in the FPGA. And there is a maximum speed at which you can run your process depending on how you've implemented everything. So actually, I think I was only able to run this up to 200 megahertz, which still wasn't quite enough for me. Now what I've actually got on the FPGA is I've got the 10 megahertz of an ISO oscillator feeding into one of the dedicated clock pins. And therefore we have the PLL that's built into the device at our disposal. So we can actually clock that all the way up to 400 megahertz if you want to, bearing in mind that there will be a little bit of jitter on that from the PLL. So you might say, why don't we just set that to the full 400 megahertz and create a counter that increases every time it gets one of those 400 megahertz clocks. And then we'll basically sample the start and the end based on the rising edges of the one pulse per second. Now actually, that's essentially almost what I'm doing. The difficulty is that you can't really run that at 400 megahertz because if you just have a counter that increments, that actually ends up with a whole ton of logic with a whole ton of daisy chained 
logic that means that it can't ever run at 400 megahertz. So about the fastest I was able to get to was 150 megahertz, and again that's quite limiting in terms of the resolution. So I had this idea, having a look at the datasheet, as to why not use the other outputs on the PLL. So if we have a quick look at the PLL user guide, you can see here for our device we've got two PLLs built into it with four edge clocks and four dividers. Now if we have a little closer look at the PLL structure, you can see here what we have is our clock input, but we actually have four available clock outputs. So we've got a primary output and then three others, and you'll notice here it says with phase shift adjust, and that's what I'm currently experimenting with. So at the moment I've not got to the point where I've started optimizing the counter, it's simply a 30-bit wide counter and it just increments each time. So we are partly limited by that and there's a lot of resources available about how to create much faster counters on the FPGA. But at the moment I'm sticking just with the basic counter and if we can do better than that in the future then we will. But what we're able to do is use the PLL to create four outputs, so just these top four, shifted by 45 degrees. And the idea is that basically we can use the four, and currently they're running at 125 megahertz, which means that we have eight nanoseconds resolution between each rising edge of that internal clock. But if we shift the successive outputs by 45 degrees, what that actually gives us is one nanosecond resolution. Now, obviously with only four outputs here, we're not able to resolve the additional four nanoseconds, but what we can actually do is just invert those clocks, and then we get eight clock outputs, all 45 degrees shifted, and then we have got our full one nanosecond resolution, and that's pretty much where Lars was with his time interval counter. So this is looking really promising, I'm still not quite there yet. It's counting perfectly, but I haven't quite got the logic correct in terms of recouping all of the data to count the pulses. But if we have a look at the VHDL, what you can see is we've got the first counter with the zero degrees offset. Uh, we've also got an extra bit of code on this one to indicate to the UART module that's on the device when it can start transmitting. But as you can see, basically, you get a GPS pulse coming in, and if it's a new rising edge, then we latch the frequency counter into another register so that we can send it out on the UR at a much slower rate. And then we reset it, and then on subsequent um, rising edges on this 125 megahertz process, we just increment that counter. And then again, once we get the next rising edge on the GPS one pulse per second, we latch it into another register. And basically we've got eight of these, so 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135 degrees, and then when we get to the 180, we're doing on the falling edge of that 125 megahertz clock, the falling edge of the 125 megahertz clock, 45 degrees shifted, and so on. So we've got eight identical counters, and bearing in mind we've got an absolute ton of logic on this FPGA, this isn't using hardly any room whatsoever. And then what we do is we've got the UART process, and this is where my logic is incorrect at the moment. I just need to work through it. Uh, but basically it works out the time difference between each of those counters, and then it's able to send that out as a 32-bit number to the microcontroller. So that's all the FPGA is doing. It's doing all the heavy counting, and then it's sending off the 32-bit number to the microcontroller, where we can then control it on there. So the first bit to look at on the microcontroller is the UART, and every time we get a 32-bit number that comes in as obviously four bytes, those are transmitted to the main loop. So as soon as we've received all four bytes, then we know that we've received some new data from the FPGA. And then in the main loop, the first thing that we do is do that little warm-up routine. Now, interestingly, that foam block made a huge difference to how quickly the ovenized oscillator stabilized, and the current that's being drawn by the oscillator is typically around 200 milliamps, but with that little foam cover, it was only drawing 160, so we're definitely doing quite a bit of insulation there. But first of all, what we do is allow it some time to warm up. Then what we do is go in and set the DAC to a low setting, and then we store that value, 
and then again we do it with a high setting, so somewhere near the top. I didn't set it exactly at the top just in case there's some non-linearities towards the extremities. And then we basically work out the difference between those, work out how many nanoseconds error you get per DAC step, and then you estimate and set it to where we need to be. And then we go into the very simple loop. Now I've experimented with a whole different range of control loops, and those I'll probably explain in another video. What I've got at the moment is very, very simple. So first of all, every time we get some data from the FPGA, which is our one pulse per second effectively, it comes in, works out the error, and then it stores it in one big array. So first of all, we've got a 64 element array, which gives us a much more accurate representation of the average frequency but we also store it on a smaller array of only size 16 and that allows us to adjust the DAC more rapidly while we're still tuning in to approximately that 10 megahertz. So at the moment there's only two steps. Really I think what we need is a PID loop to get us coarsely there after the initial attempt and then what we've actually got going on at the end is literally just twiddling the DAC value up and down. So if the frequency is a little bit high then we tweak the DAC value one down and if it's a bit lower then we tweak it one up because we don't really want to be making big changes once we're pretty much tuned in and effectively once it's in a box and covered with foam and everything like that and thermally insulated we shouldn't actually see it drifting that much so we do only want to be twiddling it one bit at a time at a relatively slow rate. Now as I said there's quite a lot more to do on this in terms of the algorithms, certainly there's a lot of measurements and learning that we want to be able to do rather than just twiddling the control loop up and down. What I've implemented at the moment is basically the minimum viable product, but really what we want to be doing is, for example, um, learning what the one pulse per second behaves like. So you keep the DAC value exactly the same so that the oven oscillator doesn't drift, and then what you want to do is learn what that sawtooth waveform looks like and so that you know exactly what value to use. Uh, similarly, what you can do is then set it into a mode where you learn how the oven oscillator drifts, and you can use all of that to provide uh, holdover, so that if you lose GPS, you're still able to slowly adjust the ovenized oscillator to account for its natural drift, and perhaps also with temperature monitoring of the room, so that if you're in a cold room, you know to drift it more than what it would be in a hot room. Uh, there's a whole range of different things to do, and in fact, the Ublox module has a lot of features which I've not played with yet, which can improve the response. Now, this one in particular is the Ublox Neo M8T, and this is specifically sort of a timing module. And these have some extra features whereby if you're in a stationary position, which I am in my house, it no longer has to worry about working out all of the positioning it knows we're in a stationary position and then it can optimize the accuracy of the timing output so we can get even less jitter from this module. However, I don't really want to rely on that because when there's these kind of modules that are super cheap on AliExpress, this gives a one pulse per second output and it has a UR output of the um, other data. But these are something like two and a half dollars each in comparison to about a hundred dollars for one of these Ublox modules. So if anyone wants to build this, obviously this is a lot more attractive than something that costs, uh, you know, relatively speaking, quite a lot of money. So I would like to try and not rely on those features, but for my own purpose in the lab, I have got a few of these modules, so I'll probably try unlocking those and seeing what difference that can make. So I think we're at the point where we can start designing the new PCB for this project and then send it out to PCBWay to get the new boards made. There's a few changes that I do need to make. First of all, this microcontroller is not powerful enough and it doesn't have enough resources. It's enough for the prototyping, but as you can see, I've had to stuff some wires in the programming header and that's because the UART, firstly, we've got one coming from the Ublox module, but the second one happens to be shared with the programming pins. And so I have to keep plugging these in and out every time I want to program the device. But I do also want another UART on here because what we're going to have is we're going to have the main board, the FPGA on the board, obviously, probably a U-Blocks module or another GPS module on a riser board that plugs into it. We're going to have the front panel, which will have some displays on it, probably two OLED displays, one with a time 
and date and the other one with all of the timing information. There's going to be one PCB at the back with several 10 megahertz outputs, probably some with sine wave, some with square wave, but then also there'll be a serial output from the microcontroller which is intercepting the data from the Ublox module and adding in the timing information that we've learnt so that we can feed all of that information out to a piece of software like Lady Heather, which is, you know, really quite a nice geeky interface. It's got all of the information on there. It'd be nice to have that displaying all of the statistics for us. So that'd be really nice. But I think I'll probably stick a DSPIC33 on the PCB. I'm quite familiar with those. They've got a lot more resources and, uh, you know, they work really quite nicely. Also, I think one other thing that we will do is we will incorporate some of the discrete PLL and analog electronics on here so that we can have the best of both worlds. We can have our super precise digital timing, but then we can also probably add some extra resolution by combining the digital timing with a analog PLL, uh, a bit like the implementation that Lars has done on there. So that's the plans for this. If you've got any thoughts or you've had any experiences with designing your own GPS discipline oscillator, then stick them in the comments down below. What I'll put in the description is a really interesting paper that I found on a commercially available GPS discipline oscillator, and that's got a whole ton of information. I've not had time to digest it, but they've described how they're able to get picosecond resolution on this, which is really quite incredible. I need to really study that probably just before I design the new PCB in case there's anything that I want to add on there. So anyway, thank you for watching. I'm, I'm sorry it's been a little bit of just a quick tour through what I've been doing. It's not really been uh, as interactive as I would have liked, but I've done so much in the past two weeks. I just wanted to get that out there so that the next video can be a little bit more interactive and we can play around with things in that way. So thanks to everyone for watching. Thank you to PCB Way for providing the PCBs. And if you are thinking about getting some little PCBs made, consider using them. I'll put the link down below. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the video. And until next time, thanks for watching.